She's here to tell you uh, why. She's got a lot of publications up here. If you haven't signed in at the information booth, uh, then please do so in this uh, little clipboard that's being passed around. Appreciate it. And if you do so, you qualify to win a green gift. It's very exciting. Very exciting. So what shade of green is that, Steve? <laughs> that would be uh, sustainable green. Ah. <laughs> Look at all these people wearing green today. I'm so impressed. <laughs> what did I do? Please welcome Sue Donaldson. I'm going to stand here so that if you can't see, there's a lot of primo seats over on that side. <laughs> You know, everybody wants to hide behind me. Okay, so as Steve says, what we're going to talk about today, look at that, my title's gone, Steve. Is and it? it's not moving forward. Are you kidding me? Well, I'm assuming it's not, it's not here. on. It's not oh, on. it's not on. It's on is good. Yeah, I, I have now, that looks, see, see this? It's all pretty now. It's green. It's green. Sustainable it's green. green. It's green. But my title. That's so weird. There was a title on here. We're going to talk today about your wells and your septics and what you need to do to keep them working well. And I was thinking about this on my way in this morning. Um, this is a green living festival, right? This is probably the simplest and maybe the most important green living thing you can do. It doesn't require buying solar panels and investing large sums of money. But ultimately, what's the most critical resource we need to keep us alive? Water. Sure, you bet. You know, you can go, I can go a month or more without eating easy, I'm sure. <laughs> I'd rather not. But, but water, you've got a matter of days. Okay? So we want to keep our water clean. We want to keep our, come on in, have a seat. There's some nice seats over here. Um, we want to keep it usable. And that's, as well and septic owners, and I don't have a well, but I have a septic system, um, that's our job. That's our responsibility to protect water for everyone else. So I have a test for you. I don't give prizes. Actually, I have prizes today. My prizes are a limited number of water testing kits. Um, so your next door neighbor, uh, your next door neighbor, I happened to, to help Sharon, tested their water and it was fine. So I don't need to test mine. They live right next door. Is that true or false? Oh. It's really, really false because you don't know. <laughs> really, really, really false. Not a little. <laughs> so Come on in, have a seat. There are some seats over here too. Um, and you're welcome to relocate because I'm going to stand right here. And you can pull those somewhere else. Okay. Why? Why? Because your well, which is really just a hole drilled in the ground to where it can get water, is pulling from out of the ground at some level that may be a completely different place than your neighbors. So you may be in two different aquifers. An aquifer is the word we use to refer to a formation of earth that carries enough saturated water in it to supply a well. So the difference between groundwater and aquifer, aquifer just means you can get enough water out of it to supply a well. Feel free to relocate these chairs if you'd like, or there are, there's two right over there if that works. I'm going to stand here and I feel a little awkward. You get to be my model today then. <laughs> okay, good. So the well driller comes in, you hire, you have to hire somebody to drill a well. 
you're not allowed to just do it yourself. They have to be certified drillers. And they drill a hole in the ground, right? And they catalog what they find as they go down. And so they're going to look and they're going to say, topsoil, clay. Can you get water out of clay? Not so well. So they'll go down until they get a water-bearing formation or aquifer. And they'll go some distance below that to give you plenty of depth from which to draw your water. Because as you suck water out of a well, or in this case, they're pumping it up out of the well, what happens right next to the well? You actually get a little depression. So you need to make sure you have plenty of extra. And they'll drill it that way. Then they put in a casing, and that's legally required. The casing is the metal tubing that goes down in there. And by law, that has to be solid for at least the first 50 feet so that you're not pulling anything from real close to the surface. Why? Why would that be? Contamination. The, mo the greatest likelihood of contamination is the closest to the surface of the, of the soil. So we're always caged at least 50 feet, and that's this solid here. And then the part where you're drawing the water has a screen. And literally, it's a, it's a metal screen that has holes in it. And your water that you drink every day is just coming from the little pores in the rock into which your well was drilled. So you are relying on that rock formation to purify your water for you. So you need to protect that aquifer. OK, then um, from there, your water comes into the house and generally goes into a pressure tank. And that stores the water and provides the pressure so that when you turn on your tap in your house, you get water, right? Um, and there's different types of connections. This is one we call a pitless adapter, it doesn't matter. But see how it's below the frost line? So you, you never have to worry about that freezing. Um, I threw this diagram in because it's a little bit important to know. When you pump your well, there is some distance that it's pulling the water from. And you'll actually see the water table decline right around the well. And depending how fast the water moves through the ground to your well determines how wide that is. And that's the other important thing when they drill their drill your well is they want to make sure the water's delivered to the well fast enough that this cone of depression, that's what it's called, doesn't go down below your pump or else what comes out? Air. Air. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm I am a water quality specialist. I don't know if you even said that, but I am. And so my, my eyes, my mind is always focusing on how do we keep water clean? How do we make sure it doesn't get contaminated? So tell me a couple ways it could get contaminated. Septic. Sure, sure. What if your septic effluent got into your groundwater? Sure, that's a simple one. And actually, here's pictures. OK, manure, if there were enough irrigation or leaching on it, you know, some of those nutrients or bacteria could get down in there. There's your septic tank, cities, and just the general pollution that comes from cities or industry. So there's a lot of things that could potentially contaminate your water. So we have certain rules of thumb. And one rule of thumb is if you're within a certain distance of an unlined ditch, that's what they mean by canal, or a lake or a stream, anybody Anybody within a quarter mile? Okay, that's good. That, okay, you are. When that well goes in, they will require it to be cased at least 100 feet down because you don't want to directly pull that water because all surface water is contaminated with what? Why don't you drink surface water? Things that make you sick. So like GR, my daughter's had GRD, it's horrible. Giardia, uh, E. coli, any, you know, there's critters out there. And where do critters use the toilet? Not always where you want them to, right? Okay, so we want to be extra careful when you're close to water. Um, who's responsible? Who has legal responsibility to protect your water? State. We do. We do is the correct answer. The state is not legally required to protect your water. The state is not legally able to stop you from using your water. Okay, so it's a two-sided thing. They have no responsibility, but they also will not stop you from using your personal water supply. They cannot do that, okay? So who, who it comes back to is you. 
the only one out there who's going to be on a daily basis worrying about your water is you. The only one who is going to test your water is you, unless there's one, there's one reason somebody might pay to test it, and that's when we have a flood event and the health department recognizes the potential consequences of all these wells getting flooded. They have in the past sometimes tested for bacteria, but generally speaking, it's up to you. So you have a choice. You can test your water or not, but the only way you're ever going to know whether it's okay to drink is to test it. And so I need a volunteer today. See, now you, come on in, there's some seats over here. Now, see, because you took this seat, guess what? You're my daily volunteer. Come on, stand up a second. <laughs> I, I, I like willing volunteers. We have a willing volunteer here. Here I have three bottles of water. Everybody see? Okay, what does this one look like? Okay, what does this one look like? Yes. <laughs> what does this one look like? Okay, which one are you willing to try? I will not allow you to become ill. Okay. <laughs> I promise. I will not allow you to become ill. Carefully stated. Just give that a little swing. And tell the audience. Yeah. <laughs> No, no odor, and actually, this is actually my tap water, which is chlorinated, and so I can kind of vaguely smell. But normally, looks fine, you smell nothing, you taste it, and it's like, huh, there's something in there. What do you think was in there? Salty. And in fact, this is my tap water, thank you very much, with salt in it. So, what did we, what did we get out of this? You can't tell by looking at your water, and you can't tell by smelling your water, and usually you can't tell by taste either. Come on in, folks. We've got seats over here. Here's one, um, and another one. Make yourselves okay. Okay, but so so we want to think that we can use appearance to tell us something is okay or not, which it does work with this, right? I'm not drinking this. And I know it's in here, so I'm not drinking this. There wasn't enough to make you throw, unfortunately. But <laughs> watch, watch. Uh, you'll be ready for your tent. Why am I willing to drink this? This is actually my You know what's in Food coloring, guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I do this with kids, it's pee. And when I do this with adults, that, and I make it a little lighter, Chardonnay, I get the <laughs> Then they want it. Okay. All right, good. So I know you're going to remember now that you can look at the appearance or, or smell and tell anything about the water. you got to get it tested. And I always suggest that if you're going to invest your money in a test, you go to a lab that's certified for drinking water analysis. You don't have to, but what that means is that they go through a strict set of methods, protocols, by which they test and they check their results and the state has overseen that process and you're going to get good data. So, you know, why get bad data if you can get good data, all right? Before you do the test, you want to check with the lab. They don't want you to use just any containers. They want you to do that sample right. You want to, when you call, ask about the costs and turnaround time. There are only a few labs in northern Nevada that do this type of analysis. One is the um, state drinking water lab, and they gave me, I have 10 sets of sampling containers to give out today, and I grabbed some cards while I was there. If you're part of a couple, um, just take one, please, because I don't think I have enough for everybody. Um, the private labs will get you the results usually faster, and they charge more. The state health lab might be a little slower, and they charge less. So that depends on what your needs are, what decision you make. I'm not going to tell you where to go. Um, what do you test for? If it's a new well, or you've moved into a new home, and the seller didn't give you a lab report, you want to test for two things. You want to test for bacteria, this is a bacteria bottle, and you want to do a series of water chemistry tests. And that's all the stuff that they'll normally give you the, the results on for a water chemistry test. Now, when I picked these up, I said, what's today's prices? They have not changed. I think it's been the same for 20 years now. Um, bacteria is $12. All of that chemistry stuff is 100 bucks. That is subsidized by your tax dollars. If you go to the private lab, it's not. Actually, for years, it was free. 
Yes, it was. Do you that remember was before that? me. That was to encourage homeowners to test their yeah. water. So it's kept at, I mean, I used to work in a lab. I can tell you how inexpensive that is for that, that suite of tests. It's a real deal. Okay? Very, very inexpensive. Um, so you do that once on your new home, or if you've never done it, do it once. You're going to get the results. Keep the results in a folder. Look at the results. If there's anything that is over the drinking water standards, which we use just to give us a benchmark, or close to drinking water standards, I recommend you test that again once a year just to make sure that you're not going up. And these are some good backgrounds to do each year also. Bacteria, the pH, or how acid or alkaline the water is, the nitrate, which we tend to have issues with here in Nevada, and total dissolved solids or salts. And um, a salty, the main problem with a salty well is you're not going to want to drink the water because it affects the taste. How um, much does that one, one year test run? You know, I, I didn't ask them for a price list. You could ask when you call. The bacteria is always $12, and then they will run these things separately, and nitrate costs a little bit more to do. It might be $15, something like that. So if you put these three things together, I'm guessing in the $30 range maybe versus the whole everything for the hundred. It's, it's a real deal when you do the domestic analysis. Um, so, and then every five years, we recommend you go ahead and do it once every five years. This is where people, you know, start to get sticker shock sometimes, but I have to tell you, I'm on a Washoe County water system. I'm mandated to be on that. I live up the Mountainous Highway. My bill last month for water service, ha, <laughs> this is funny, it happened to be $112. <laughs> so for the month of July and the month of August, each month, I paid $112, which is the cost of this test once every five years. Do you feel better about it now? <laughs> okay. I am paying for Washoe County to deliver safe water and do all the testing. By law, they must do that testing. They must give me the results once a year, but I'm paying for that. How much time do you do it on? An acre. Yeah, I have over 100 trees. I don't have a lot of water. Okay. <laughs> and I have a vegetable garden. It's my trees. Yeah. Um, but they, Washoe County also has a tiered water system. So your basic, like, winter use uh, under 5,000 gallons for me is $20. And then your intermediate use goes up and your higher use you pay more for, which makes tons of sense. Okay. Now, um, I've told you about testing your water. and. There are, we're going to show you how to do it in a second. Let me just hang on to that for a moment. But when, when might you want to do something with your well? Steve said I was going to tell you all the hard stuff you had to do. If you have an old well and it's not constructed to, to the, today's standards, and in Douglas County you follow the state standards, um, you don't have separate ones. If, for example, your well head, this is the part of the pipe that sticks up, is a below ground in, in a um, container like that. Water can get in there and can slide down and can contaminate. So you want to make sure you have a well driller look at that and they can raise that for you and seal it. Um, if, excuse me, yep. you're saying old well, what, what do you Oh, think? prior to the 70s. Prior to the 70s. The, the current standards came about in the 70s. Okay? And ha, does anyone have an older well? I have, yeah, I have um, gone out to people's properties where their wells are from the 30s even, and, and that's not a picture, but that's what it was like, one of them. Okay? That we didn't have the same standards to protect wells at that time. If this ever happens, whether it's from a flood or your own irrigation or whatever, the problem with this. My hands. You've got a pointer. I'm Italian. I have to use my hands. You do have a pointer. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. In the middle. This thing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, this is underwater, right? And I have nothing to mark the screen, so I'm okay. Um, when that happens, water loves to slip down the sides of the metal. And even though we have sealed around the well to fill in the space, they use most often a clay that soils up really tight around the well. Even so, there's a high likelihood that that water will slip down the outside of the well and contaminate your groundwater. And especially if you have animals, for example, pastured in there with manure, 
you know there might be bacteria, right? Just from the animals. So this is a situation, if we have another flood and we had a drought, we're in a drought, so what happens next? A flood, and it seems to happen. Do, once the flood, waters have receded, do the bacteria test. 12 bucks, do the bacteria test. Okay, um, so I already talked about those areas. When your well is in a pasture with livestock and livestock waste, the best thing you could do is to fence off a little area around it. Now, I would like to see you fence off 50 feet, but that may not make any sense for you. So I'll just say the more you can set it aside, the better. The other risk besides getting the manure right around here is the animals um, can damp physically damage your well. If you have a thousand pound horse or cow or more, just by walking near it, they can jostle that well, loosen the well, sometimes even crack pipe. Okay, so this should never be at a minimum. You fenced around it, or some people at a real minimum, they put old truck tires or something around it, and at least it keeps the animals from leaning on it. But better off would be to just go ahead and fence around that. Okay, if you've ever had an accident with pesticides near your wellhead, or for some reason somebody sprayed right over your wellhead, you need to sample that water. You need to test for contamination. This is a worst case picture here. I'm going to use it, Steve. So they applied something on this farmer's field up here, and then they irrigated, and they irrigated enough that it ran down into this yard. But that wasn't the worst part. It ran past the irrigation hydrant there, and that's, a, that's actually a legal problem, but you have to test that water, make sure that whatever that pesticide was, it didn't get in there. And test it for that particular pesticide. Yes, yes. So if you if you call the lab and say, I think there's pesticides in my water, they're going to go, uh-huh. Now, when you extract different things from water, you use different methods based on what the chemical is and what it will, like, is it soluble in water, is it more soluble in oils, etc. So they need a general idea of what it might be, or you're going to pay big bucks to try and isolate what that chemical is. Does it matter how deep your well is? We're getting there. It does. It absolutely matters how deep your well is. But let me just show you the sampling procedure. So somebody tell me what's wrong with that picture. <laughs> the jar's not clean. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So if you're going to invest your money in sampling your water, you want to get a good sample, right? That's just That just makes sense. So for the chemistry, the lab will give you free, and then you pay when they run the test, three bottles. You're going to get in a clip that doesn't belong in there. You're going to get a large bottle. There's nothing in this bottle. You're going to get a bottle for metals. Notice this has a, can you see that, a liquid in it? And a, can you help me again? <laughs> <laughs> and a very good band. And a small bottle, this is for nitrate, OK? When you go to take the sample, um, you don't use your own container. These are all clean to start with, so no contamination there. Um, you must have an active well. So if it's a new well, they want you to run it for a minimum of 24 hours. If the well hasn't been run recently, they want you to run it for a minimum of four hours. You want a good sample, so my recommendation is irrigate outside for a while and do the sample after that. If you decide to sample at your kitchen tap, and the reason I often recommend that is that's probably where you get most of your water from that you drink or cook with, most of us. And that's what you're most concerned about. Unscrew that aerator, you know, the, the little thing that makes it stop from shooting out in a jet. Um, the reason for that is when you wash your dishes and stuff, you can get food particles in there and you might have some bacteria that aren't harmful but can become an issue. So just unscrew that, clean it out before you put it back on. Now, turn on your faucet. Let it run five minutes. You don't want anything sitting there at the end of the pipe. You want a nice, fresh sample coming through. So let it run for five minutes. Then you're going to fill this. You're going to fill this. And you're not going to empty it out or overflow. Just fill it till it's right about towards the top and fill the nitrate bottle. Leave the stuff in the bottles. So they've got acid in there to preserve it. Okay, so three bottles for the routine domestic. Thank you, Vanna. That sure. was wonderful. You know what? Do you want to test your water? Sure. You get a set. Oh. <laughs> he's, he's being really patient. Now, this is called a bacteria bottle. This is a little different. It has a white powder in it. You probably can't even see it. 
but when you get up close with it, you'll notice a white powder. That's to stabilize the sample in case there happens to be chlorine in it. Don't rinse this bottle out. So when you're testing, run the tap, fill those, then take the top off and see this line? You need to fill it to the line or slightly above. Don't, you don't need to fill this one completely to the top. Just go past the line and then put the cap right back on. And with this, you're going to fill out one form. I'm going to keep your form right away. One form, and it says bacteria. See? Bacteria. One form for this one and one form for that one. Okay? Perfect. Now, um, you don't want your bacteria sample just sitting around in the house for a few years. They will not accept those samples if they are older than 30 hours. Wow. So you need to plan this carefully. You can take it to Carson. There's a drop-off location on the forms or you can take it straight to your lab in Reno or wherever you're going. Now this happens to come from the State Health Lab because they're at the university and I work with them. So I, I ask them for their, and their, they love uh, having you guys test your water. They're always happy. Um, so these would go back to the State Health Lab, which is at the north end of the campus, up by the post office and, and Channel 5 there. Yeah, and I can, I can give you that too. But um, so you take your samples, put them in a cooler, keep it cool, go straight to the lab. Um, I recommend, you know, pick a day when you can, you can get to one of those two sites and you run your irrigation at 6 a.m., right, or something, and then do take your samples and go straight to the lab. And that's going to give you the, the most accurate results. Question over here. So Question. Is a water softener or filter going to make a difference on the results other than hardness? It will, if you take your sample at the top after your whatever treatment system, what you will learn is whether your system is working. It won't matter otherwise, but you will get the test results on the water treated by your system. If you want to know the water straight out of the ground, you do it from the well or a spigot before treatment. So that's up to you. And if it's the first time you do it, I would actually say do before and after so you can compare. It costs more money. But that way you know what your water system is getting you and whether it's accomplishing what is needed and whether it's accomplishing the goals. On that note, don't let the Culligan man turn the water blue and tell you I, I, that was bad. <laughs> The, the water treatment system provider, <laughs> I don't know any Culligan men. It's from all those years of radio and TV advertising. But, you know, whoever wants to sell you a system, what do they want to do? They want to sell you a system. So don't let them do some quickie in the kitchen, you know, magical voodoo and sell you a system. You do your separate test. You invest that hundred bucks before you invest on a multi-thousand dollar system. Right? Be smart. Okay. Um, now, you're going to get the results back. If it's from the state health lab, any of the labs will do this, they'll flag it if you exceed the drinking state drinking water standards. Those are the same as the EPA's drinking water standards. They adopted the same ones. And those are standards that the municipal providers like I have must achieve on average. Okay, so they, they say what can be in my water that I pay for. You can use them as the benchmarks for determining how your water is and whether you might want to do something about it. Most of your water, generally speaking, is pretty good in Douglas County. We have two potential issues overall, um, and, and I shouldn't say two potential because there's more than that, but two common issues is better. Bacteria, <coughs> so you've got something in the water that could make you sick, and the most common type of illness would be diarrhea, right? Okay, you know, gastrointestinal distress. But we also sometimes see either nitrates or arsenic. And those cause completely different problems in humans, but those are common ones in Nevada that you might want to consider treatment or alternate drinking water source. Okay, this is what, they actually are computerized better now, but this is what a report would look like. This one is from 07. I didn't do a newer one, but they'll give you, they tell you this is the routine domestic, all that chemistry stuff, and they give you the results here, and right next to it, they'll flag if anything is exceeding, and this one was fine. And they give you the recommended levels here, so you've got them right on there. Um, some of the stuff, it doesn't matter. Hardness, do you know what hardness is? 
Hardness is minerals in your water, most commonly calcium and magnesium. They don't make you sick. And in fact, calcium is known to be good for heart function, for example, and bones, of course, we know that. Um, but what do you get? You get scaling on your dishes, on your shower door, and also some people care about hardness, but it's not something you would, you would um, not drink the water for. Okay, and here's the second page of that. So you can see all of the data and information. This one, um, see this total dissolved solids here? 532 milligrams per liter. Ooh, that's hard. One drop in a million drops per million. That is a little high. There's nothing wrong with it, except it can affect taste. It just means we've got substances dissolved in the water. Okay, so that's the kind of a report you get. And it actually says right here, Chemical quality meets the state of Nevada drinking water standards. You can't read that, but that's what that says. So they'll let you know right up front. Suppose something does come up and, and you want more, you can go to this site online if you're a computer user. And after you tell it where, where you are, because they want to collect a little information, um, it doesn't go anywhere, don't worry then you can put in what your levels were and it will tell you where that is relative to the drinking water standard and what it means. Okay? And I have copies of this PowerPoint that I'm going to give you at the end. I don't want you leaving through while I'm talking. And so you'll have this site. I have 20 copies and so again, share. Okay, so what do you have to do so your water doesn't look like that? That is not from the United Go States. Deeper. That picture. Go deeper. Go deeper. Well, it's, it's hard to say why that water has so much dirt in it. I would assume a lot of that is dirt. That may be um, rust or something, too. This was from a, um, I can't remember, but like Kenya or something, someplace in Africa. So um, there's three biggies. Where is your well? Do you all know where your well is? Yes. How many of you have a wellhead a foot or more above ground? Or who doesn't? Let's, let's do it the other way. Is there anyone who doesn't? Good job. That's the first thing. You want that, why? Why do we want that to be a foot or more? Right. We don't want it to be at ground level where any water running off could get in the well. Really simple. Is there a cap on the top of your well so that things can't get in there? And I've heard all kinds of stories about dead mice and stuff in unkept wells. Oh, yes. Okay, that would be the construction and then the condition of your well. So do you see that wellhead there? This is an example of not not a good location. It's a foot high and it's capped, so that part's good, but they need to address the location here. And you can see it's wet, so there's irrigation or something going on there. Um, this is a neighbor of mine, and they built their horse corral around their well. What I, um, they are not there anymore, um, and they don't have horses anymore, but I would have just suggested why not just fence off this little corner here. They didn't need that space, so you don't have the large animal pressure on there. A well-protected well, and you can all go home and look at this, the ground right around the pipe that comes out of the ground, the well head, we call that, the ground will slope away from it. Same reasoning. We don't want to capture water. So imagine this. If it sloped down to the well, the water's going to sit there when we have some runoff, right? You want the opposite, and you can do that yourself if you need to. Just build it up a little, or trench around it, um, and divert the water. But you don't want water sitting right around the well. That increases the chance of it getting contaminated. You also want to know that when they built your well, they put this grout. It's called grout. It's the substance that fills the space between the soil itself and that metal casing, is that white? Um, it would be light in color most often, yeah. And they concrete the top. You've probably seen the concrete. Um, they always have to make that hole bigger because they need the pipe to go in absolutely straight. So the hole's always got an extra couple inches or more on it. They fill that with grout. Old grout can crack. Now hang on, I have a cracked. I'll show you a cracked picture in a minute. Old grout can crack. So when you go home today, I want you each to go to your wellhead and see if you can move it. If you can move it pretty easily, it's a bad sign. You need someone to come out and take a look at your web. It should be firmly in place, okay? So what's the problem with this one? It's indented, it's indented easy fix, right? But it's a foot above, even after you fix that, even after you, you fix it, you're still a foot above and it's got a nice strong cap on it. 
So those two things are good. I can't tell what the land use is there, but it looks like the irrigation is over there and not here, so that's good. It's not good to irrigate on your wellhead. Okay, what's wrong with this one? Short. Too short. Got a cap, but it's too short, and that's manure around it. It's hard to tell. <laughs> what's wrong with this one? Everything. It, it is not a foot, foot above ground. It does have a cap. It's got its whoops. It's got its wires out and exposed. Um, you know, so that may, you could get a short or something for your hump. Yeah, and it's submerged. So we need to work on that one. And this is what it looks like when you have old ground and it has cracked. Okay, you will sometimes, not always, you can see the concrete has cracked and there was some, something happened to that well. There was an earthquake or something, you know, that really jostled it around enough. This needs to be fixed. This is important to fix. At the time they come out, this one, so this is probably another um, picture from Kenya or someplace. They would then extend that pipe up and they would cap that well if it's still even usable. Okay. There is a ton of wonderful information available to you online. Um, and the, I'm, remember, I'm going to give you the, the handouts. Um, if you just go EPA drinking water wells, it would come up. But that's the actual site. This is what it looks like. And there's a ton of information about contaminants. You can go on a virtual tour of a water treatment plant if that interests you. Um, but lots of basic information for you on health, et cetera, related to your well. So you can get much information from this site. And on some of your sites, try to find out. Uh, okay, that's not mine. Well, well to, that's yours. Okay. Fair enough. Right. <laughs> trying to find a well drillers log for. I bought a, a remodel. I can't find out who drilled it to find out if it's really 115 foot deep right. and mm -hmm. things like that. Where do I? Where well, can I go? Good. Good. Um, by law, the driller is required to keep that log, and you must provide it to the state water engineer. The state water engineer is in Carson City. His name is Jason King. And um, they're in Conservation and Natural Resources. Uh, do you have something to write with? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't. Um, Jason King, um, state water engineer. If you um, can't find that, I have the number in my office. And you just let me know. Okay. No, they're not on Nye anymore. They built Stewart. a new building on Stewart at the south end um, before it comes out onto 50. Richard Bryan. Yeah. Oh. And so Correct. the only the thing MP. is how hard it's going to be to find that record. And I don't know how well computerized they have them on it or not. But but that's where you get that from. Okay. They, they had to keep records. They have some online. Yeah. 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 They have some but online now. Some, well, how old is your well? 82. Well, yeah, so I don't know how far back that yeah. goes. You may have to physically go and do some. What did you call Jason King? On this Jason track? King is the state water engineer. So the way this works is that we have this person called the state water one person, state water engineer, and he's the one that has jurisdiction over all the groundwater. So the wells, the pumping, who can have a well, holds the well logs, who can take water from one place and move it to another. That's all the state water engineer. Okay. Um, okay, so we're halfway in or more because I think I have to be out of here at 10 till. Yes? Quick question. Yeah, water what, questions. What about testing before you move on? What about testing for radiation in water? Um, you can, you would be testing, for example, for radon uranium. or uranium, then uranium decays into radon. Um, so you can do that test. You have to take the sample in a particular way that the lab will direct you on. Um, the biggest risk to you from radiation is in the air. It's breathing it in, it's not drinking it. When we drink it, it mostly just passes through us. But if you have radon gas <laughs> dissolved in your water, where the risk comes in is if you um, run long hot showers in a small closed bathroom and you breathe that because you're crazy and you take four showers a day or something. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, what you want to do is test the gas level in your house and not worry as much about your water. Uh, I was just wondering because it we adds had a to rentals problem in Colorado where we just bought a house, tested it, and it was off the charts. Yeah. Where uh -huh. you know the they said stop drinking your yeah. water now. Yeah. And then when we moved here, you know it's similar high desert, and we tested. And they thought we were crazy for testing, but it's the granitic rocks. 
that's where the uranium coming from is from the granitic rocks. And so the closer you are to the Sierra, the higher your risk. So like I have, I had to mitigate my house for radon, for example, uh, in, in the air in the house. And then those of you who live more to the east have less of a risk. So everybody mute your phones now, then you're good for the rest of the day. So, but call the lab and ask, it probably is expensive. Well, you already did I just it. didn't know, we did it. I just didn't know, do you have to do that like every five years as well, like you were doing the others, or? You know, the chances are the rate, the, the so you got some level of pico pe 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 curies per liter, right? Yeah, and it was below the 400. Okay, good. Um, that probably won't change dramatically. No, that's not something our activities really are affecting. It's naturally occurring in the raw materials. So unless something happens to your well and you dig it deeper or put in a different well or something, I don't think you need to worry. What was it? Well below that? Uh, yeah, it was. Good, good. That's that's really good. Like I told you, my house was high. Okay. Um, any more water questions? Do you feel like now you could go home and take a sample and get it tested? Okay, and I brought a total of 10 sets and you've got one, so there's nine more for people. Um, what I will do is when we're done here, we're gonna go outside so the next group can get set up and we'll go over there and I'll give out the remaining ones to whoever wants them. Um, okay, so we, we advertise wells and septic systems. Now we get personal, because I got one so I can tell you my stories. So which of these is a way you're allowed to dispose of your household waste? You can use a cesspool, a pipe to a ditch, a pond, or a pipe to the storm drain system. Which of those is legal? None of them. Good job, I heard none. And I also heard cesspool. Why can't you have a cesspool? Well, a cesspool isn't necessarily open, but a cesspool is just like a tank in the ground, and it doesn't have any way to filter and distribute the effluent. So that is illegal now. Long ago it was the way they did it. Think of a pit toilet. Um, I went to Alaska and helped build a house and we had a pit toilet. <laughs> it's okay to have one or two pit toilets. It's not okay to have 50,000 pit toilets. That's when we see groundwater contamination. And the more we concentrate the waste in one narrow spot, the greater the likelihood of getting that waste down in the groundwater. So we want to spread it out. So, what are these? All right, so what does that look like, that thing you never see unless you build a house and check it out? A <laughs> uh, septic tank, a system, exactly. So, and a tank is the first thing we think of, right? Um, when you flush your toilet, run your shower, your dishwasher, your washing machine, any indoor house use? Well, uh, let's not go there yet, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to finish, otherwise. Okay, so um, that goes into a tank literally a tank, usually they're concrete, they can be made out of other substances, but the most common is a concrete tank. So all that stuff, including all the wastes, and it goes into the septic tank, the solids start settling out, and then we take the relatively clean effluent and we distribute it in a leach field or drain field. You guys know where yours is? Yeah? Somebody doesn't? Okay, we need to find out where yours is. Okay, what it's meant to do is take those wastes Remove the solids, like I said, process until the stuff coming out is pretty uniform and somewhat lower in, in those waste materials. So, and I, I found this, look at this. This is from some historic um, poster. Yeah. Um, so we have moved beyond the pit toilet level, thankfully. Um, what happens in your tank is this. You flush, you flush the toilet. It comes through the pipe, it hits what's called a baffle. This is problem point number one, okay? So the waste is coming here and it has to take a right angle turn down. That's to get it to go to the bottom of the tank and not just float on the top. So let me tell you my first septic story, I have several. When my, uh, one of my daughters was a teenager and I raised them, you don't put anything in, in down the toilet, but what came out of you in the toilet paper. <laughs> well, she, uh, being a teenager and a girl, um, used a lot of Kleenex and equated Kleenex with toilet tissue. What's the difference? It's toilet dissolved tissue dissolves, dissolves easily and Kleenex stays together so you can blow your nose in it, right? So she, I guess she was putting logs down there. It backed up into the tub and the shower waste. Yeah, it was not nice, because guess who got to clean it? Um, and what she had done was made a little clog right here. It just came through in a mass, 
and sat here. And so as we flushed the toilet, it just came back in the house. And, and so what did I do? I had the guys come out and they pumped it out and cleaned that out for me and never another problem after I chewed her out pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's grown and yeah. She has herbs that thing now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually she doesn't. I wish she did. Okay, uh, so you flush. Um, the solids will tend to settle out to the bottom and then you have the, you know, not very clean looking liquid here. And on top you'll get the scum that's your um, oils, like cooking oils and stuff, and soap suds. Sits on the top, and that's actually kind of good. It keeps it anaerobic in here so the bacteria can work on this. So there's bacteria in that tank, and that bacteria comes from you and me, and all, it's just what comes out of our body, and that helps break down the waste. You don't need to actually add bacteria. We, we have plenty. We share our bacteria freely on a daily basis with our tank, okay? For the last, I think it's at least 30 years now, um, most tanks have two chambers, that's generally required. So the first chamber is going to hold about two-thirds, enough that it'll take a whole day before things start coming out and moving into the second chamber. Why do we do that? If anything starts escaping out of here, we got a secondary level of containment for those solids, okay? Um, Factor fixture. It's not necessary to pump your system if you're careful with what goes down the drain. So I'm very careful, other than my daughter being stupid, but um, or not knowledge. Um, so, do I need to pump my tank? Yeah. Of course, because let's go back to this picture. So what are these solids here besides, you know, the obvious ones from your insides? But what are the other, do you wash vegetables in your sink? Yeah. Okay, is there some dirt on them? When that goes down in there, does that break down by bacteria or biological functions? No. No. Sand particles, they're pretty permanent, right? What else is pretty permanent? Um, uh, pla any plastic, cigarette butts are pretty permanent. Uh, coffee grounds take a long, long time to break down. Um, cat litter, which is clay, isn't going to break down. Don't ever put that down. Oh, please. Okay, so there's always some degree of stuff that is inert to these bacteria. And with time, no matter how careful you are, I don't care how careful you are, you will start to build up a sludge layer. The more careful you are, the longer you can go between pumping. If you want to use your kitchen sink as a garbage can, plan on pumping frequently because you're going to build that level up. Okay? So that was false. Here's what happens after some period of time if you have a pump. So this was what I was kind of worried about, but I do pump mine on a regular basis. So that wasn't the issue, it was just clogging here. But with time, and especially if you're, if you're not careful or don't know, your sludge layer can build up so much that there's almost no space for the liquid to go. And, and when you run the liquid in there, it kind of just shoots across and goes right back out into the next side. And if that fills up, like you see in the picture there, then you start getting solids going out into your leach field. Now, what's a leach field? It's just pipes with holes in them. Below the ground surface, constructed in some gravel, etc. But it's just pipes with holes in it. And what happens when you have particulates, solids, in pipes that have holes? You bet it clogs them. You do not want to clog this part of your system. That's where that effluent is going and spreading and the rest of the biological processes occur in the soil with uptake by plants, filtering through the soil. For example, a lot of bacteria are kind of relatively big and they get stuck and then other things eat them in the soil. So you want to keep your leach field healthy and functioning properly and that means not getting solids in it. So here's what those tanks look like. Notice there's two things here. One, two. That's where you can get in to pump both sides of your tank. Okay? So when they pump it, they're going to say, if you've dug it out and you only got one hole, they're going to say, there's another one, find it. Or you can have them dig it out. Okay? And here they are constructing the leach field. So it comes, this was a great picture. It comes from the tank, there's some distribution line, and here's where it gets um, routed into the different, this one seems to have four leach lines. The number of lines depends on your soil infiltration, and um, most often it's just based on your soil type. It can be anywhere, but it should be the opposite side of your house from your well. 
So if your well's in the front yard, it should be in the backyard and vice versa. Minimum of 100 feet separation. We're getting there too. Um, then, so this is sitting in, they'll put it in gravel, a gravel bed, and they'll cover it. And it can be covered with as little as 6 inches or as much as 18 inches. Mine is pretty shallow, as a matter of fact. <coughs> and with time, the bacteria set up housekeeping at the bottom of this, and they make what's called a bio bed. Sounds pretty cool, huh? That's just a layer of active bacteria who love the nutrients in the waste and are taking advantage of it. So after that, your last line of defense between the, the biomat and your groundwater is what? The soil itself and the depth of soil. So I think someone asked, if your well is, is tapping within 25 feet of the ground surface, that's a red flag. Um, obviously it varies based on what your soil is, et cetera, but if you want a general rule of thumb, if your water table is within 25 feet or less of the ground surface, you need to be super careful. If you're 50 feet or more, that's a lot of soil to get to if, if your system is properly done. Okay, does anybody have an engineered leach field? Oh, I'll go really fast because you probably know what it is. That's in a situation where the depth to groundwater is shallow and there's no place for the effluent to go. You would be required then to take your leach field up and normally that's about five feet. So you've got five feet of distance till it, till it goes to the ground level and that's what you're looking at. So the leach field is in here, okay, and they've built it up. That requires a pump. So you have an extra a lift station to get it in there, an extra thing to check and keep track of is your lift station. Make sure that pump is working or it doesn't go anywhere, okay? Um, so you all should know how big your tank is. Three things. How big is your tank? My tank is 1,250 gallons. We built our house, so that was easy. Um, when was it last pumped? Seven years, in my case. I have two of us living at home now. My kids are gone. And where's my leach field? It's out past my backyard, in the back of the house. OK? So to maintain that, you have to pump the tank at a certain interval. This is my backyard. Look, at, isn't that nice? They put the tank right in the where our grass is, <laughs> so we have to dig it up. But um, you want to pump that on a regular basis to keep those bacteria functioning and to keep the solid, and you want to keep your bacteria functioning, keep the solids out. So, um, oh, and here's something. You, if you're worried about solids, you can also retrofit a screen. Most often it goes at the distribution box, and then you clean your screen. Um, I, I haven't needed it. Ours is 30, over 30 years old now, and the only issue has been that one with the clean ones. Um, you can, if you don't have these things, you can have them added to your tank. They just bring the openings to the tank up to ground level so it's easier to access. Um, I wish I had risers, but I also haven't been motivated to put them on. So, I, I had a son to dig out my tank, but now he's 25 and left. Okay, so how often should you pump? And this is in one of the handouts as well. Um, first of all, how big is your tank? Remember I said mine was this? And I told you it's just my husband and me now, so I need to pump every eight years. So when am I going to pump? March is my time. Next March is my, my time. That's, uh, I can dig the grass up and it's cool enough that we can get it back growing. Yeah. Um, now, what's very, very interesting is if you don't know this stuff and you don't want to try and use this table, the state recommends you pump every two to three years on a routine basis. So what does that cost? Since it's been seven years on me, um, I'm sure it costs even more than this now. I think the last time I paid around 300. Has anyone gotten theirs? 45. 45 for what size? Wow. Uh, I think ours is a thousand. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know it's going to keep going up. Um, so, so I'm sure it's a bit more than this. Um, but what you need to know is if your leach system fails. <laughs> Depending on the type you have in your case, it's very expensive because not only do you have to put it in another place, but you have to build it all up again, etc. So engineered systems, more than twenty-five thousand. Regular, more than five thousand. Probably approaching ten now. But the problem is, you have to have a different place to put it. And depending how big your lot is and how it's arranged and what you have there, and remember, you want it to flow downhill if at all possible. Um, yeah you can be in a world of hurt. And there are some folks in Pleasant Valley that after the, the flood of 97, they're in a low-lying area and everything flooded, and so their system didn't work because there was no place for that. Everything was 
full of water already, no place for the effluent to go. They had to bring it to Sandy Hat for more than six months just, just to take care of their waste. So you want to really, really be careful of your leach field. And what would you see if something went wrong? Well, one thing you could see is like I did the sewage backing up, and usually that's probably more likely a clog somewhere. If you have a leach field problem, you might not know for a long time, and then what you'll see is ground that you step on it, and boy, it feels wrong, spongy. Um, if you see sewage at the land surface, that is a bad, bad <laughs> sign. And this is what it might look like. You'll have a wet area, and it won't just be wet. It might smell, and it'll usually have some you know, darker looking uh, substance <laughs> there, okay? So the other thing you might find if it's not working as well as it might is, Whatever's growing on it is going crazy. There's an awful lot of nutrients going there. Now, it is fine to have things like grasses and shallow-rooted plants to help take up the nutrients, but if there's a dramatic difference, that suggests you're getting an awful lot of nutrients moving through there. So, which of these would be good to flush? Which can you put down your system? Toilet paper, Kleenex? Yeah, number one is the only thing that should ever go down your system. I, we kind of covered this with my story, didn't we? Um, but uh, maybe women don't understand, don't put your sanit or tell, tell those of us who are still in age that use those things not to do that. Um, okay, you don't want to put excess cleaning products, nothing that might kill those bacteria. The bacteria are your friends. They are chomping away and breaking down the waste. You love those bacteria. They are not yeast. Do not put oh, yeast. Don't put yeast. Yeast doesn't do it. I started out, I was there with you, 35 before I got in the business. Um, no, you don't need anything down your tank normally. Nothing. You don't need Ridex or anything else. They cost money, and in an exhaustive study of 48 tanks from different locations, they found zero difference in that sludge level between those who used and those who did not use. And so you don't need to spend that money. All you're doing is, you know, enriching the company. When might you want to do it? If you have a catastrophic accident with your tank, so no to that. And any of these brands are just pictures I stole off the internet, don't worry about it. Let's suppose something like two gallons of liquid bleach or five gallons of Lysol cleanser went down your system. That could kill the bacteria. That's enough. That's the break off. So a cup in your wash is fine. A cup of bleach in your wash is fine. Two gallons, not fine. That's when you might want to seed your tank with something that has back, not yeast, but bacteria in it to get it going. Okay, so you're okay using a normal, like a cup of bleach and a couple loads is fine. I have to finish up here. But never put gallons of bleach down. Okay, um, so you, you want to keep your system working well so you've learned these things. You're not going to water on your leach field, if at all possible. Get your vegetation started. Then it's going to get some, you know, use low water, use grasses or whatever, and it'll get vegetation. Why not water? You don't want anything to drive the wastes down to the groundwater. Okay, don't flood it, this, the, the system, the whole system. And my, my story there is I used to, having three kids and working, would come home and do like 20 loads of laundry on the weekend, it seemed like. That's a lot of water to put in the septic at one time. So I started to do a load a night to spread it out. That's easy. It actually was easier for me. Watch the solids and toxic chemicals. Don't use your garbage disposal. You're just adding a lot of solids and asking a lot of the bacteria. So I keep a strainer on that side. I run it maybe once a week just so it doesn't get nasty smelling. There's nothing in it. Um, and I, I compost, so I take that stuff from the screen and compost it. Don't drive or pave over your leach field. We need it to evaporate. And pump, pump. If you have never pumped your tank and you have lived in your house for 20 years, I recommend that you get it pumped soon. So I will hand out um, copies of this presentation. I have 20, so you'll have my phone number. I also have business cards here. Um, you'll have all the links, and we have like we have to transition. One. Oh, you want me? No, I just want. Thank you, Sue.